Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Rabbi Julia Andelman here, Director of Community Engagement at JTS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session of our series, The Other in Jewish Text and Tradition. Um, special welcome to any first time attendees, and you can view recordings of past sessions uh, using the link in the email that you received earlier today. I just want to acknowledge and uh, apologize for the technical issue last week. I know um, several people were not able to get in. Just, just to uh, explain full transparency, our Zoom account allows for a thousand people, so plenty for um, for every session. And uh, for some reason last week, the the um, the limit was changed to 300, and we only discovered it when when we saw that the participation was capped at 300. So we were able to fix it um, within a few minutes, but I know that many people um, gave up in the meantime. So we were really sorry about that and hope you received the recording by email in time to watch it for Purim. Um, we are so pleased to have uh, Dr. Barbara Mann today um, teaching us today. Her session is called Facing the Other, Moral Dilemmas in Israeli Literature. And um, how could we have a series like this um, you know, on the other without, without touching on one of the most um, present and visible issues of, um, of Jew and other in our time? Um, although that's certainly not uh, not the limit of what Professor Mann is going to be discussing with us today. So I'll introduce her further in a moment. Um, first, I want to uh, thank so much um, the sponsors of today's session, um, Dr. Carmen Arik in loving memory of Joyce Arik and Marion Rothenberg in memory of her husband, Frank Rothenberg, who admired JTS from his teenage years and onward. Uh, thank you so much to both, both of you and your families um, for sponsoring today's session. And if um, for everyone else, if you're feeling inspired by this opportunity to engage in Jewish learning with JTS's Outstanding Scholars, we invite you to consider partnering with us by sponsoring a learning session. Uh, we have two, two levels of sponsorship, Chacham for $540, dollars and Sadiq for 1000 um, to learn more you can contact learning lives at jtsa.edu and again we thank both of our Sadiq level sponsors today uh, just to cover some logistics um, we will be uh, professor man will be pausing periodically for q a and we will do that using the chat feature so um, you can send a private chat to me rabbi julia andelman um, which then when the time comes, I will select from the questions that I've received uh, to, to pose some to Professor Mann. Um, if you have a technical or logistical question, uh, you can go ahead and send those via private chat to Lynn Feynman or Rabbi Tim Bernard. Um, you should have received the sources for today in, in the same email that I referenced earlier, but we will also share them in the chat. Um, and I think that that covers it. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Barbara Mann, who is Professor of Cultural Studies and Hebrew Literature and the Chana Kex Professor of Jewish Literature at JTS. Her areas of expertise include Israeli and Jewish literature, modern poetry, and the fine arts. She's the author of Space and Place in Jewish Studies and A Place in History, Modernism, Tel Aviv, and the Creation of Jewish Urban Space in addition to numerous scholarly articles. Uh, and her current project, The Object of Jewish Literature, A Material History, is under contract with Yale University Press. Um, thank you so much, Professor Mann, for teaching us today, and I turn it over to you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for, for organizing this. I'm really delighted to be with you today, just after Purim, and just as the the sun, the days are getting longer and the sun is coming back to New York City. So hoping for uh, upward upward uh, mood all around and more Zoom sessions for a while, okay? So um, I'm gonna suggest if you are able, if you have a minute and it's not hard for you to print out actually the sources that were circulated earlier uh, and that were circulated again in the chat. If you don't have a printer or you don't feel like printing them out, that's also fine. We're gonna share them on the screen. Um, but uh, if you're able to have them even on a separate device on your phone, as long as you can 
refrain from doing other things on your phone while you read poetry, then, then that's good. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Is that, are we, yeah, did you have, excellent. Okay, so behind me, even though we're all zoomed out here and I'm, I'm still kind of low tech, I'm a bit of a Luddite, I have to confess. I mean, I read poetry, right? So I must be a Luddite. Um, you know, I, I just put up just a kind of a, a map of where we're gonna be going this afternoon. And uh, to let you know, I'm just, I'm gonna make some introductory comments about two big ideas. One about lyric poetry, like why we're, you know, what poetry gives us that we might not necessarily get in other genres and other kinds of literature. And then I'll say something specifically about modern Hebrew literature. Um, and, and then we'll move into uh, the three poets for today, Don Pagis, and you can see their dates up there, born in 1930 in Bukovina, in Bukovina in Romania, Yudha Amichai, 1924 in Germany, and Dali Rabikovich um, in 1936 in Ramat Gan. So it, it wasn't until I actually put this board together that, it, that I realized that they are really all contemporaries. You know, there's something about meaning to say they were born within a decade or so, they were born within the same time period, more or less, but there's something about the rapidity of chain of the evolution of modern Hebrew literature and maybe just like the density of events in uh, the early 20th century within the Jewish world or on the planet um, that makes me think of them as somehow occupying uh, different generational cohorts, but they are more or less um, contemporaries. So, um, so the first thing that I want to say about the lyric, right? So the lyric is, it's probably one of the most common poetic genres that we have, right? It's typically short and it's uh, typically uh, ex uh, sort of expressive, has a kind of an emotional valence to it, right? There's some kind of a, a expression of emotion and it's often in the first person. It's grammatically the first person, right? So you get like an I and a U in the poem. It's, it's not always in the first person, but even when there's not a kind of a grammatical first person in the poem, because of its brevity, because of its shortness, and because of the emotional experience that can, that's conveyed, there's this kind of implicit uh, uh, first person quality to it. So without making you know, the fallacy of confusing the author and the speaker, we can, we can sort of uh, imagine a situation in which an emotion is expressed and that kind of, uh, uh, those generic conditions, again, the brevity, the, the brevity, the first person quality and the emotion lend themselves to the kind of staging of an ethical situation with an implicit other, with an implicit, sometimes there's actually a you in the poem, um, but even when there's not, there's something that's implicit and that you could be an actual other imagined person uh, you know, that the poem was written with that person in mind. Um, and more often than not, uh, it's the reader. Right. In other words, so lyric is a genre that implicates the reader in in some kind of conversational or dialogic uh, condition. This happens without you knowing it. Right. You don't have to like agree with this. This is sort of the conditions within which the lyric is written. Now, specifically when it comes to modern Hebrew literature, um, which again we we can think of as merging from uh, emerging in the early 19th, mid 19th, late 19th century, emerging from the Jewish enlightenment, from the Haskalah and poetry as a genre in Hebrew is almost always connected to prophecy. And, and the role of the poet from the get go, right? Now we're talking about late 19th century, we're talking about people like Chaim Nachman Bialik, like Chernochovsky, uh, where, where the role of the poet is connected to the figure of the prophet because of the sort of the expectation that Hebrew literature would address some sort of collective or national set of themes or terms, right? And so we have a lot of poetry which is overtly prophetic in which the, the poem sounds like it's a prophetic text, um, but even when it, when it isn't, even when it, when it isn't explicitly connected to a prophetic text, it has, it retains that kind of, what I would call kind of a trace or an echo of those prophetic texts. Now, remember, we're talking about lyric poetry, we're talking about modern Hebrew literature. These are secular texts. I just wanna make that clear. While many of the authors, particularly in this early period, in the late 19th and early 20th century, many of the authors may, th may themselves have come from religious backgrounds. These are not poems that, were, that are part of liturgy, 
Um, they're not meant to be prayers, right? These are secular literary texts. And even though, I mean, I'm talking for a minute here about, again, this kind of this early formative period, late 19th, 20th century, and we're, we're mostly in Eastern Europe, right? When we're, the poems that we're looking at were composed and published um, in Israel almost a century later, some of these same kinds of assumptions and ideas kind of undergird the production of poetry in Israel. And certainly the, you know, the kind of the assumptions that an average uh, Israeli Hebrew reader might bring to one of these poems. So for example, uh, poetry is, is, is published very widely in Israel. It appears, if you've ever been in Israel and you've bought the Friday paper, which is kind of like the equivalent of the Sunday paper in this country, uh, there's a special section in which poetry appears. So poetry is very widely circulated. Um, it's a part of public discourse. Sometimes it even appears on op-ed pages in the daily papers. And so there are expect there are kind of not so much assumptions, but just expectations that the poetry um, will engage maybe even a contemporary theme, a political theme, uh, a theme of kind of social or cultural import. And again, remember that what I what I mentioned in relation to the lyric, there is this kind of, I mean, to call it a contract is, is kind of too strong a term, but there's this kind of implicit relationship between the poem on the page and the reader. And as a reader, we are implicated in some sort of situation that is described in the poem. Okay, so that's a little bit about the lyric. That's, that's kind of my, op those are my, um, sort of operational methods when I go about reading um, Hebrew poetry. I'm going to stop um, at sort of after each poet, right? So we'll, we'll talk about Don Pagis, and then um, I think that the hosts are collecting questions in, in, from the chat. I'll stop after Pagis, I'll stop again after Amichai, and then we'll have time at the end after Rabbi Kovich. Okay, so, so the first uh, selection of poems, and I'm going to read some stuff out loud, and you can, you know, I'm, some I might read in Hebrew, some I might read in English. You can follow along, you can ask questions. Um, but um, I want us now to look at this first series of poems um, by Don Pagis, right? Um, so the years here are kind of important. So first of all, um, these are poems that are published in 1970. They're, a, they're part of a series, right? The book is called Gilgul or revolution, and the, the series is called Karon Khatum, right? Or a sealed car. And in this series, and they're short, right? So this on your readout, on your the handout, these are the poems on page one, two, and three. These are all part of, uh, um, they're all by the same author. And they're a series that the trajectory of which traces a kind of a, I wanna call it a kind of a before, a during, and an after, right? Um, the first couple of poems on that first page there um, either speak about the period directly, a voice sort of relating, uh, uh, describing Europe before the Holocaust. Then there's a kind of a during, there's, there's a, a kind of a physical fragment of a record uh, of someone who's, who's trapped in one of these cattle cars, perhaps being moved to a concentration camp. There are a couple of poems, this is on page two, where they're kind of set in the camp itself. And there's this attempt to imagine the experience of the perpetrators, right? To imagine what it meant to be a Nazi guard in these camps. And then on that last page, um, the final two poems are this kind of, what we might call a kind of a, a rehabilitation of the survivor, a transformation. What, what does the self have to confront, experience and go through in order to survive, in order to kind of come out on the other, hand, on the other end of this experience as human? Right, as I mean, these poems really ask what it means to be um, human. So I'm gonna read aloud the first poem. Again, this is on page one. It's the first poem in the series. Some of you may have heard this poem in other settings. I would say it's it's probably one of the, you know, together with Elie Wiesel's Night, it's probably one of the more, more well-known uh, pieces of literature. Uh, Anne Frank's Diary would be another one. It has that kind of status in terms of writing about the Shoah. So I'm going to read this short, short poem written in pencil in a sealed railway car. I'm going to read it out loud in Hebrew. Here 
קין, בן אדם, תגידו לו שאני... Now we could spend the next hour just talking about this poem, but we're not, I'm sorry. Um, but you know, what we have here is, again, we have what appears to be um, a, a, a written fragment, a fragment of a kind of a, a voice that was recorded in pencil in this car, a record of who the person was in, in, in that moment, who I'm gonna call her she, because the first person declares that they are Eve. So I'm gonna, gonna be gender normative for a minute. I'm gonna call her she. And we get this kind of uh, little overlay, right? Of the biblical family of Eve and, and Abel and, 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 and Cain. And Adam is actually present in the Hebrew, right? Because a son of man, when you, that, that's a translation of the phrase ben Adam, the word Adam in Hebrew means, is, is translated as man. In, uh, in English. So you get this kind of uh, an, an overlay of the biblical family in a, a setting which is unmistakably 20th century, right? Sort of sealed in this railway car, headed, headed someplace no good, I'm gonna say. Headed to some, there's some kind of implicit violence at work in the poem, not only because Cain is absent, right? And we know that, we know from, from Breshi, we know from Genesis that that, the, that this idea of physical violence is associated with Cain, he's not there. And also because of the way that last line is, is cut off. And again, with all due respect to translators, there's a little bit of a fudge here, right? So a more literal translation of that line would read, tell him that I, and then it's cut off, right? So um, again, I wanna mention just that the character that is not present here, who, who is present in that biblical scene is God, right? And, and of course, this question of theodicy and kind of the absence of God and where was God resonates um, for contemporary readers and becomes really one of the, the big themes um, within, uh, within writing about the Shoah. Now again, notice before we move on to the other poems in this series, I just want you to note the year, right? So the book is published in 1970. The translation comes out a number of years later. And 1970 is kind of, is an important, it's important for what it uh, comes after, which in terms of the Israeli scene is of course the Eichmann trial in 1964. And so up until this, up until 1964, and this is a kind of a, a conventional uh, historiographical schema that I'm giving you here, right? Um, up until the Eichmann trial, the voices of survivors in Israeli public discourse were largely absent, right? There, there was a lot of ambivalence and the Shoah was very close in temporal terms. It was only a couple of decades away. So, you know, when we, when we look and I, I can see on the call, you know, the sort of the, the ages of many of the participants on this call, some of you may even remember um, a time in your own lives when uh, you first heard about or understood that survivors had testimonies to give and voices that could bring important things to the conversation. But, in, but up until the Eichmann trial in Israel, at least, this was not the case. And the survivor was a kind, we talk about self and other, right? The survivor was um, a figure that was not really uh, recognized and in many cases not respected um, within Israeli public discourse. Notice how I'm being careful here. I'm not talking about people and their families. That's another story. Um, but what's remarkable really, again, about this series of poems and the arc of the experience of the survivor before, during, and after the Shoah is that this is really one of the earliest iterations of that narration that we have in Israeli public discourse in modern Hebrew literature being published in 1970. So there's lots more here, but we're gonna, we're gonna just move forward a little bit uh, into the second stage in this, uh, in this series of poem, and that's on your page two. So these two poems in English, Testimony and the Roll Call, Tim, you could probably just move that forward to the next page for the people who are following here, Edut and Amizda. So both of these poems, Testimony, it begins, no, no, they definitely were human beings, uniforms, boots, how to explain, they were created in the image, him nivra'u b'tselim. So again, um, you know, the Hebrew here is very evocative. So in both of these poems, we are 
in this kind of imagined world, we're in this world of the camps and the speaker in the poem, who, again, this is, you know, sort of using that first person to, uh, to create kind of an intimacy with the reader, the speaker in the poem, in both a Dut testimony and a Mizdar, the roll call is describing the perpetrators and trying to sort of understand who they were, what they were, how, how is it that they were created? And they were created in the image of God. We know this um, again, because in that third line there, the end of the fourth line in the English, right? They were created in the image, the Hebrew, right? This is this kind of, uh, again, the, the, the biblical notion of, of humanity being created in God's image. Um, so there's a, a, an attempt here to kind of, a uh, bridge is a strong word, but let's just say to reach out, to acknowledge uh, the gap and maybe even some kind of shared humanity between the victim slash survivor and the perpetrator slash Nazi. I mean, this is a lot. It's a lot today in 2021, but it was a huge amount. It was a huge imaginative leap um, in 1970. And for, for Pagis, again, to embed this recognition difference, right? There is difference, right? He says, I was a shade, a different creator made me, right? I'm different from that person whose humanity is suspect. But there is a kind of an attempt to understand what goes on in, um, in, the, in the psyche, right, uh, of the commandant or the, the, the guard in the Nazi camp. So in the roll call, we have this description he, stand, he stands, stamps a little in his boots, rubs his hand, he's cold in the morning breeze. Suddenly he thinks he's made a mistake, et cetera, et cetera. And in both, I would say the ending of both of these poems, testimony and in roll call, notice what happens to that I speaker. Um, there's a sense in which they disappear. It's this kind of self erasure, right? And in that first poem, it's compared to smoke. And of course that brings us to the, the smoke of the crematoria. Um, but then in the second poem, there's this kind of um, uh, erasure of the self, even the shadow is erased in that second poem. So I think implicit here is the suggestion that in order to recognize the humanity, in order to understand uh, the psyche of the perpetrators involves a little bit of self erasure, a little bit of problematic self erasure. I'm gonna say just one more thing about the final two poems and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause and see if there are questions um, or comments here, right? So these final two poems, instructions for crossing the border, again, these are, in terms of the temporal arc of this cycle, Kaon Khatum, the sealed car. These are, this is the sort of the after. This is kind of the, the physical, logistical and emotional baggage that goes into rehabilitation, re recuperation. How, how does one survive? In other words, how does one become a survivor? And so the instructions here um, in both of these poems kind of, and I'm gonna read a little bit of both of them right now, because I really think that we need, to, we need to have this poetry in our ears, right? Notice how the images, um, what I'm calling the logistics, the logistical instructions here um, involve uh, you know, things that we would think of having to do with actual travel. And then there's a kind of a metaphysical or kind of an emotional, what we call emotional baggage, right? That needs to be worked through. He says, Adam Badui, imaginary man. This is instructions for crossing the border. Here is your passport. You are not allowed to remember. You have to match the description. It's almost as if he's been being given a passport for another person and, and being told don't remember who you were. Now you're going to be this new person. You're going to sit in the train. You've got a decent coat. You have um, a meil. You have a goof mitukan. Your body has been repaired. Your body has somehow been fixed. And you have a new, a new name. Hashem achadash muhan begoncha. And the new name is like it's ready there. It's right in your throat. Sasa asul lechalishka. Go. You are not allowed to forget. And then there's that kind of paradoxical command there at the end. So don't remember too much, 
rebuild yourself, use that new passport, create a new life, but also there's no way you can ever really forget. And then in that final, um, final poem, Pegis, um, you know, in a, a really, I think just kind of shockingly brilliant way, he sort of, he widens the scope, right? And, and here um, he, he moves from the individual tikkun, right? The agufa metukan, the body that's been repaired to something called a kind of a national tikkun, this, this idea of reparations, right? And this was something that in, again, after the Eichmann trial in the late 60s um, and before that as well, but really, you know, picked up steam, I think in the, in the 60s, this question of, of tashlumim, of, of reparations, what kind of financial and economic reparations would the German state make to the state of Israel um, uh, as a kind of a, a kind of a monetary settlement for the damage of the Holocaust. And this, obviously this is a kind of an on, right? This is ongoing into our own day. Um, you know, every few months, there's another story in the paper about something that's been paid or something that's been restored. So this, this idea of restoration or reparation, reparation contains the word repair, right? Which is both material, but also, um, you know, kind of emotional, right? So in this poem, we get a little bit of both. And of course, um, you know, the, the beautiful reference there, um, the biblical reference to Yechezkel, to Ezekiel, right? The smoke will go back to the chimney. Um, you'll already be covered with skin and sinews and you will live, right? This is a reference to this kind of uh, messianic uh, vision of, uh, of, of the redemption of the bones in, again, in that prophetic text of, of Ezekiel. You're going to be back in, you know, just as you were in Europe, you're going to be back reading the paper even the star will emigrate to the sky. Um, and so, you know, again, uh, just very briefly, I see that uh, Rabbi Andelman is on, which means that she wants me, she might have some questions. Um, but just to, again, just to reiterate, in this first set of poem by Pegis, we see um, the lyric as a, the lyric poem as a kind of a setting in which different kinds of relationships can be staged, right? So the speaker in relation to their family, the speaker in relation to God, the speaker in, re in relation to uh, what we think of as the perpetrator, and then the speaker in relation to their old self, right? In those, those poems where there's this kind of, the passport is given and there's this idea that the survivor, remember, will be different than the person who was a victim, perhaps. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here and, and see if um, Julia or Tim, whoever's gonna put some of these forward. Do, we, do, do you want me to stop now for a moment? That would be great. We have a couple okay. of questions. Sure. Um, okay, I have a question from Laura about, um, actually, Laura, I'm gonna hold off on your question for one moment because I got another question um, from Judy, which I think might be helpful to everyone. If you could, if you could just, um, can you just give us a few more sentences of background about Pagis? Pugis was, a, was born in Bukovina and he was a survivor, came to, um, came to Palestine as a, as a teen and was reunited with his father in Palestine. Um, he, um, in addition to being a poet, he was a scholar of medieval Hebrew literature and a prolific translator and he died too young. 1950, he was only 56 when he died. Um, but he, but he really, you know, this this collection, um, parts of which were actually translated by Ted Hughes, I think again, you know, kind of made its way um, into an international audience. And the, the poem itself, that first one that I read, actually appears in a number of different Holocaust memorial and museum settings uh, around the world. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. That's all I've got. But. Um, okay, so let me get to um, to Laura's question. Um, she was noticing the, um, the use of the word sail, which is translated uh, in one place as shade, another place as shadow, but um, he uses that in multiple places. And she was uh, she was sort of suggesting or asking, you know, in a way, the um, the souls lost in the Holocaust are are like our shadows, you know, the shadows of the descendants and the survivors sort of always following us. And she was also wondering, is it also maybe a reverse? Like we're, we're the shadow of them sort of 
coming coming in their wake, but uh, maybe you could um, just comment on on the use of his, that repeated use of that word. Okay, so now I'm inappropriately thinking of the uh, um, Peter Pan, right? But we know, and the shadow, right? We know. I mean, the idea of 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 a, of a human shadow. So first of all, I would say, it, it's it, it's absolutely correct to sort of connect that to some notion of the self, right? And so. The, the, the ani, the I, and the tzel, that's like the foundational self-other relationship when you think about it, right? The I and the shadow that is cast by the human body. And, you know, why it's translated one time as shadow and another time differently, that's like translator's license. You know, we have a lot more words for things in English. And so typically, um, these are Stephen Mitchell's translations. He's a very fine translator. This is nothing against the translations, but often, uh, when translating from Hebrew to English, Hebrew poets will use the same words over and over again to create a kind of an oral pattern for readers, particularly if they're words that have a kind of a biblical resonance. And English language readers, even when they get this, it's almost impossible to reproduce in English because in English we think repetition is boring. So the word that I think the auditory, I don't have a whiteboard here. Well, let's see, I'll describe, can I, um, can I erase this? What do you guys think? Yes? Sure. Yeah, because this is important for, I won't spend this much time on every question, but here's the word tzel, right? This is, we call it tzel. And then, can you see that? Yes, okay. And so, and it means shade or shadow. And I think that what Pagis is doing, maybe somebody knows on the screen. There's another word that's so important in these poems that contains the word tzel, and that's tzelem that we talked about, right? Which means image and this idea of tzelem Elohim, right? The image of God, which of course comes from Breshi. So you see how the tzel is, is, it's the same word. I mean, they're not, I don't think that they're related etymologically. I wouldn't go that far, but when a Hebrew reader reads this poem, you're hearing the echoes there. And you're asking the kinds of questions that, who, I don't know who that was who asked that question, but precisely that kind of question. What does it mean to be a tzel? What does it mean to be a shadow? Do you come after or do you come before? And we know that shadows can do both, right? I mean, that's the marvelous thing about shadows depending upon where the sun is. So um, there you go. That's my Thank you. elaborate answer. Um, I'm gonna put together a couple of questions on um, kind of the, the religious Jewish piece here. So, um, so Rob was noting um, in that powerful image of the, the star being torn from the chest and emigrating to the sky, you know, does that maybe pr refer to the, to the narrator's own Judaism fleeing? And then, um, and then um, Lori was, uh, she was asking about the in testimony, um, you were talking about the soldier was made in, in one creator's image and a different creator made me kind of the, the theology of that. So two questions about kind of religious belief and identity here. I, am, I have to confess, just to go to the second question first, I have no idea. Um, I don't know when he says a different creator made me, I'm, I'm imagining that's his way kind of, you know, just kind of rationalizing this whole idea of Tzelen and that the perpetrator was also made that that humanity involves that kind of brutality and violence um that you know there's there's this kind of attempt you know I, I i came from someone else i can't possibly share with that person you know there's there's that sort of reflection but you know the question of 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 um you know the 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 notion of the the star being a kind of a uh, letting go of his um, religious or spiritual beliefs. Unclear. Again, you know, Pagis himself was not, when we know, when we get to Amichai, I can give you a more definitive answer because, or a, a better answer, right? Because Amichai, we know, came from, you know, had that early religious education and, you know, sort of said something about, you know, well, when you get older, you get wiser, right? Um, but Pagis didn't, didn't have that in the same way. He had more of a secular background. But in the case of the star there, there's a kind of a, um, an, I wanna say kind of an appropriation, obviously, of that, of the star that was worn 
in the, in the camps, you know, and so there's there's something of that there as well. I'm I'm not sure about the theological piece, honestly, but you know, readers delight. I think that, in other words, I think that when you read a poem, this is what we bring as readers. This is part of the lyric the lyric thing with the I and the self, right? As a reader, you bring whatever kind of uh, you know interests or assumptions that you have, and certainly for a reader in the early 21st century. The idea of again, you know, where was God? The absence of theology, or the, the problem of theology in the Holocaust, is is on point for sure. Do you want to take one more? Yeah, quick though, because we're going to run out of time. But okay, yeah, yeah. Well, so, um, just a, a request maybe to comment on. Um, you know, he he refers to smoke so many times, and and of course, there's there's an obvious reason for that. Um, one one participant, and I'm sorry, I. I can't find now who it is, but one person suggested, um, you know, the image of God accepting a sacrifice. Um, but but that word comes up in so many of the poems. Um, maybe you can comment on that. I like the sacrifice. You know, I mean, I think that it it seems to me that it is also um, aside again from the obvious sort of setting of the camps. Um, you know, that there's something there that's, con I'm going to say that's connected to the shade and the shadow. In other words, it's another, it's another one of these kind of viscous substances that seems to signal something or mean something. Um, it's a trace, it's something that is left um, in the air. But, you know, if you want to go in the direction of the, the smoke and the sacrifice, if God is absent in these poems, then what's the sacrifice for, right? I mean, that would be, that would be one sort of theological reading of that smoke. So kind of a, a, a sacrifice in vain, maybe even without putting too much. Okay, so we can move on, yes, to the, to the next poem. So um, Amichai, um, and we're, we're getting these poems from the, you know, this, it's amazing to me uh, as, a, as a scholar to sort of think about how, how long ago these poems um, were written. And by the way, I want to say that that all the poems that we're looking at today are there. I haven't cherry picked them. They're, they're poems that I have happened to to be fond of, um, but they're deeply canonical works, right? These are writers whose work um, and who, you know, as figures and for their poetry are really at the center um, of modern Hebrew literary history. So in Amichai's poem, I'm going to, I think I'm just going to read the whole poem. It's short. I'm going to read it. Um, I'm going to read it out loud in Hebrew. And again, I want you to, to think about while I'm reading, um, what is the situation being described? What's the kind of the emotional tenor of the poem? And if there is a kind of, a, again, a, um, a conversation or a, a duality, some sort of I, I, you know, self other uh, scene that's being staged, who's, who's involved and what is their relationship. An Arab shepherd seeks a kid on Mount Zion. שנינו רוצים שלא ייכנסו הבן והגדיל לתוך תהליך המכונה הנוראה של חד גדיה. אחר כך מצאנו אותם בין השיחים, קולותינו חזרו עלינו ובכו וצחקו בפנים. החיפושים אחר גדי או אחר בן היו תמיד התחלת דת חדשה בהרים האלה. Again, for the Hebrew reader, you're in a kind of a familiar topography here, which is at once has a, a material tether, right? So like Pagis's poems, there seems to be an actual setting refer, being referred to. And here in Amichai's work, in Pagis's work, it was the interior of, of, of cattle cars and concentration camps. And here in this, in this poem, it's the actual topography of Jerusalem, right? Um, and if you live in Jerusalem, you know where these uh, uh, you know where the Sultan's Pool is, and you know where Mount Zion is. But there's also obviously another topography being referenced here, and that, of course, is the topography of the Book of Genesis, specifically the, the topography of the Akedah, of the sacrifice 
of Isaac. So, uh, you know, and this is, I'm gonna say that this kind of um, use, deployment of biblical terms, biblical scenes, um, biblical phrases, biblical imagery, this is like the bread and butter of modern Hebrew poets, right? I mean, this is um, even, again, in a poem like this, this is a secular poem. This is not, I know that Amichai's work has kind of made it into um, American Jewish liturgical practices in, in ways that I sometimes find problematic, but that's another discussion. But just to confirm um, that these are, these are not poems that are meant to be prayers, even though they draw on what is arguably, you know, one of the most uh, sacred motifs and, you know, sacred landscapes within um, within the Judaic tradition, um, the, the mountaintop area where Abraham almost slaughtered his son, if not for um, the ram, and if not for the angel who, who stayed his hand, right? Um, so we're there, we're in, that, we're in that place, we're in that, that biblical story again. But the, again, the characters, again, like in the Pagis poem, the characters are just, there's something just a little off. Things are not proceeding in exactly um, the way that we remember. And so if we're asking about the confrontation between, or the, the encounter, let's say, between self and other within, uh, within modern Israeli Hebrew poetry, this would seem to be a kind of a classic encounter, right? Um, an Arab shepherd and a Jewish father. And the Jewish father is looking for his son and the Arab shepherd is looking for his goat. And even the way that they are um, you know, located in the topography, right? They have their voices are together. There's a kind of a pool. They're together and apart, right? They both want to prevent the son and the goat, they both want to find them and they want to prevent them from entering into what he calls the terrible machinery, the terrible mechanism of Chad Gadya. So we have to ask, what is this mechanism? What is it doing here? What is Chad Gadya, right? I'm thinking now of the relationship between these two uh, sort of well-known motifs within the Judaic tradition. The one is the Akedah, the almost sacrifice of Isaac, right? And the second is Chad Gadya, which is of a different, um, it's, it's a different domain, right? It's not a sacred text. It's not a biblical illusion. It's more, I'm going to say, on the line of, in, 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 in sort of the domain of, of kind of folklore or oral tradition. Chad Gadya as a poem, as a song in um, the Agada, in the, in, the, in the Passover, as part of the Passover service, dates to about the 16th century. That's kind of the earliest version that we have. And the first version is actually in Yiddish. Bet you didn't know that. We could talk about that after. The first version is actually in Yiddish. Um, but it's come down to us as a, not, a tech, not technically a part of the Seder, but kind of a peripheral part of um, not a part of the Haggadah, but a kind of a peripheral part of, uh, of the ceremony that is traditionally held during the Seder. And the, the, so it has a kind of an interesting relationship there to tradition. It's normative, but it's not absolutely canonical. It's not sacred. And what is the terrible machine? What is the terrible mechanism? See, here is where I miss having people in front of me, because I'm sure that any number of you could jump in here, right? So whereas the Akedah, right, the sacrifice of Isaac is kind of a one and done, right? There's the almost and then the substitution of the ram. You remember uh, Abraham has been commanded to, to go to the mountaintop and to, to slay his son. And at the last minute, the angel comes and says, wait, don't touch the boy. And then they find a ram to sacrifice instead. I mean, I has another poem actually called the real hero of the Akedah is the ram. So he's stuck on this theme. And that's different than Chad Gadya, which is cyclical. The violence there is, it, it keeps going and going and going and going. It's compounded even. There's no resolution. And, you know, in revenge fantasies, which is, you know, some one of the ways in which uh, Chad Gadya could be read, right? 
um, the, the, relation, the power relationships there keep building and building and building. And there's no resolution, there's no peace, there's not even symmetry. So just kind of pay attention to those two different um, cyclical apparatuses, right? The Akedah, the sacrifice on the one hand, and Chadgadya on the other. But then they're found. Everything is fine. You know, this has happened before. Looking for a kid, and notice it's it's not ram, right? It's the the the, the it's not an aisle. It's very uh, particular. It's a different term here, and we could ask, why does Amichai, if he's so interested in evoking the akedah, then why doesn't he use the Hebrew term for ram? Why doesn't he say aisle? Because I think he really is interested in this other domain as well, in the domain of folklore, chad gadya, one kid, one kid, but also in something that, that, that feels like it could even stretch back into diaspora Jewish life, even though we're in, again, this kind of very land of Israel topography, the goat is that animal that for Hebrew readers is really embedded in a kind of a, a pre-modern Jewish life in Eastern Europe. And so it seems to me, I mean, if I, if I try to kind of understand the tenor of, the, of those closing lines, I wanna say that it, it feels like there's a shared experience, that there's something in common, that even though they are standing across from one another, and even though one is a Jew and one is an Arab, they share the topography, they share a concern, which is, a slightly unequal concern, right? There's a difference between a child and a goat, right? The loss of one is enormous compared to the loss of another, but they seem to share some kind of common experience. And even that line, um, you know, Kolotenu Chazuelino, our voices returned to us and cried and laughed inside us, the plurality there, that sort of first person plural there, the we-ness of it, seems to suggest that there's this kind of shared experience. And then we reach back even further into the notion of the Abrahamic uh, traditions of Islam and Judaism, kind of sharing some origin story, right? If not the topography itself, then certainly some origin story, maybe even the topography itself, some origin story about that topography. I'm, I'm kind of dwelling on this because we're going to see something really radically different in the Rabbi Kovich poem. And I want to say that when this poem was published, right, it, it, it poses, right, if we want to, I'm not going to translate this into political terms, but you could see sort of where it goes, where the symmetry and the shared experience um, allows for, again, if we're, we're thinking about this model of self and other, um, you know, allows for kind of a mutual recognition and some notion of shared experience. The common enemy here for both the Jewish father and the Arab shepherd seems to be that kind of cycle of violence, which, you know, once it starts, we know how it ends. Okay, I'm gonna pause again and see, I kind of said a lot there, but I'm sure you'll have things to say. Julia, do you wanna? Yeah, um, so I have a comment from Barbara and Barbara, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, but um, you know, one, there's such a powerful image here with the two, um, you know, the, as you were saying, the topography kind of two facing mountainsides um, and, and this kind of wanting to connect and be similar or see parallels, um, but actually they stay apart, right? They, they, um, the, the laughing and the crying happens within them. Um, and and um, Barbara's comment was how um, how often it's it's kids, it's children um, that can connect across these divides, which is I'm just it's really ringing true to me. I'm thinking about around the election. I know you you said you didn't want to go all the way there with politics, but um, you know there were some parents in my in my son's school who stopped speaking to each other, but the kids are still talking, you know, and mm -hmm. and uh, voicing their parents' <laughs> views that they've been vibed, but. Um, it, yeah, it, it's a it's a powerful it's a powerful image of sort of this permanent separation as symbolized by the topography, but sort of this mixing of the kid and the kid. It's I think that that is actually, um, you know, when I think about other poems that Amichai wrote about Jerusalem, and there are many, there are many many, um, that it is often um, 
uh, there are poems in which that that child, and it's often kind of the spontaneity of the child. I'm thinking of one, you know, where a child flying a kite, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, and sometimes I think in retrospect, it's it's hard for me. I read a poem like this and it feels very utopian. And I know that since 1980, this is not how things have gone. We are in the horrible machinery of Khad Gadya again and again and again, and we can't seem to escape it. So I, I, I sort of feel like, this is a poem that is really of its of its time. It's a ma I mean, to say thinking about self and other, it's always contextual. It's always historically embedded, and it could be that this is the moment that you know when this poem was written. There there was an idea that there that even though the laughing and the crying takes place inside, that there is a kind of a mutuality. There is something shared there. Um, anyway. Thanks. Um, I want to uh, share a question from Emily, um, asking more about that, the, the last line of that poem, what is, what is the new religion? You know, it, notably absent in the poem is Christianity, right? So, um, and, and that chadasham is echoes for a Hebrew reader, that chadashah, the phrase that's translated as new religion, um, for the Hebrew reader echoes as Brita Chadasha, the New Testament. And um, so I think that there's, you know, Amichai, the, the, the poem is sort of, it's pointing to these, are the origin stories of religions and how they kind of can get us in trouble, but that they, you know, if we kind of go back and peel away the layers, I mean, it's a, it, it sounds sort of facile to say it now to think about, you know, the ways in which um, that topography are kind of present in really important ways. I mean, this is, you know, also in the, the temple on the, the Sermon on the Mount, et cetera, et cetera, right? There are other, there are other events that happen in this topography that belong to those uh, three religions. And so I think that he's just kind of, I don't think that he's pointing forward to a new religion, if that's what you're asking, but it's more like the inventiveness that the place kind of produces um, these new ways of thinking about God. Mm, it's really interesting. Um, so Rachel is pointing out how um, that we have a lot, we have key characters in in the Hebrew Bible who are shepherds like mm -hmm. Moses and David. Um, and she's saying they they eat those two in particular, in her words, they each began new eras, um, sort of new national phases. Uh, so I wonder if you see um, if if you see a reference there? Well, I mean, I, I don't know, because it, it seems to me, you know, that the shepherd figure here, we're going to see a little bit of this in the Rabbi Kovic poem as well, but that the shepherd figure, which is like itinerant, um, is specifically marked as Arab here. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure, you know, we can think about those shepherd figures in the Bible as also having a kind of an itineracy or, you know, kind of a nomad nomadic-like existence. Not in the spirit of nomad land, but you know, in, in, the, in, in, in the sort of, in the wandering, in the tradition of Jewish, of Jewish wandering. So yeah, they're, they're definitely both part of that landscape. Um, just one, one final question I wanted to, uh, there's so many uh, really interesting comments that I wish I could share. Um, um, but th there was a question uh, from Stephen, do we need to worry that there's any kind of um, that there's a racism here in comparing a Jewish child to an animal on the Arab side? I, I don't entirely understand the, the question. Um, meaning a child is is I, I think you know instinctively uh, someone who we feel more more empathy for than a lost animal. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I think that there is a problem with equating the two. In other words, and so for me, the readings of the poem, which, which set up that symmetry um, between the two, they, they do kind of, it does, that's one of the places where it breaks down. Because as I mentioned earlier, right, the loss of a child is not equivalent to the loss of a goat. So, um, you know, and also notice how just the way that the, the Jewish figure and the Arab figure are 
kind of flagged in the poem, one in relation to his status in the family and the other in you know, some other kind of you know, related to an activity that they, that they do. So I would say that there is, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where the racism would come in. I'm, maybe I'm just missing, missing something really obvious, but it, it seems to me that there is, there is a way in which that the distinction between the two breaks down the symmetry, but also I would just add, remember that there's another way in which this, which that kind of binary, right, that that opposition is broken down because Amichai is not giving the Hebrew reader the word that they want, which is ayel or ram. In other words, we're in, and you, and we 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 wonder why, right? In other words, if uh, that could just as easily, if you're just looking for a you know livestock that's attached to this topography, um, what is the goat doing there? And I think it's partly again. As I mentioned, this sort of reference of it, it, it Judaizes the goat to call him a goat because of that connection with Eastern Europe, but also because of the connection to Had Gadya, right? In other words, the, the one kid, one kid. Do you want to take another? Do you want to go on? We could take one more, sure. Yeah, Ooh, okay. okay. Yeah, we can take one more. Um, so this is from Jennifer. She writes, is the indirect source of potential harm in the poem an indication of Amichai's own comment on the ongoing harm between both sides of conflict? Oh, it is, it is, alas. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great point that the violence here seems to be sort of external to this particular relationship, but we feel like it's out there and it's not something that they can control. This question of agency is huge in Rabbi Kovic's work, so maybe that's a kind of a, a good segue. So I don't know if we're going to get to both of these. I'm looking now at um, the final two poems, a Jewish portrait and hovering at low altitude. I'll start with a Jewish portrait and then we'll, and I'll take some questions and then we'll see if we have time. I can say something about hovering at low altitude as well. So these are, um, so Rabikovich is, um, I would say after Amichai, uh, the major, the most influential Hebrew poet of the last 25 years or so, right? Well, we gotta say half century now because she died in 2005, but her work continues to, uh, to, re to reverberate in really important ways. And these two poems um, were written uh, during the first war in Lebanon, 1982. So they were published in 87, but they appeared already in, uh, in, you know, were kind of circulated in newspapers and in anthologies of political poetry um, about the war that were already circulating very immediately. And this is sort of, you know, I kind of alluded to this uh, at the very beginning of today's session that there is a kind of a topicality or um, a very, a, a presentness in uh, a lot of Hebrew poetry. And so these were poems that were written during uh, during the war in eighty two and published almost immediately, um, and in in I want to say that you know if in the Amichai poem this is how it sort of connects for me um, I mentioned there that there there was a kind of a rhetorical ten tension in that Amichai poem between the the ostensible symmetry right the one facing the other and then this other I'm going to call it that compounding cyclical violence of there's a kind of a tension between those two structures. And in this poem, um, the structure is, is something that we might call a kind of a palimpsest or almost like Venn diagrams, right? So that the, the, the two quote unquote sides here, the Jewish side um, and the Palestinian side are, are kind of blurred and overlap to the point that it's really, you know, one is described in relation to the other and it's kind of hard to sort of, to separate them and put them in different places in the poem itself. This is one of the challenges I think of reading the poem and it's a rhetorical strategy, right? And so if, you know, just to kind of, to zoom out, oh, did I say that zoom out? To zoom out for a moment, right? To this, this bigger theme of, of self and other, one of the implications of, I mean, of, of Rabbi Kovic's poem is that the other is inside the self, right? That there's no, firm distinction and, and they're always, you know, there's always this kind of blurring and this reciprocity um, that goes on in terms of defi defining the self and relating to the other. They can never really be 
um, disentangle. So, Dukan Yudi, a Jewish portrait. And notice here, I don't know, the Hebrew title got kind of knocked off there, but you have on the bottom of some of these pages, I'm on page five now in the handout, um, you have the wonderful, uh, the, the translator's notes from the wonderful translators, uh, Hannah Bloch and Hannah Kronfeld. This is a, published in a Norton edition of the, the collected poems or the selected poems rather of Dalia Lavikovich. And, um, and they've given us um, notes that, that, that kind of point us towards the important motifs and important tropes that Lavikovich is, is using. And the first one um, is in the title, the Hebrew title. Um, and the note there means both portrait of a Jew and portrait in the Jewish style. And I, I, I wanna say a la, a la Rembrandt maybe, right? So we're, we're in, in that world, but also the term Dukan itself, um, it's a Hebrew word, but it comes from the Greek. So we're already like in this, you know, amalgamated, we're already in that space where, where Jewishness is kind of embedded in something else always, or, or, you know, kind of trying to understand itself in that, that kind of classical, the first of the great binaries, the, the Jewish Hellen in the Jewish Hellenic world, right? So I think that, that there's something about the title of the poem which, which calls that up. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read just the first few lines in Hebrew and then I'll, I'll talk through some of what is going on. He, lo me'asug shalachem, יהודיה גלותית מבידה לצדדים בפחד, לבושה סמלה מיושנת, שערה אסוף ביכן. So the she in this poem is not your sort. And Rabikovich, you know, these are, her work in this period in, in the 1980s is tremendously polemical and political. And so when she says you, she is speaking in this instance, to the Israeli Hebrew reader who might encounter this poem in a newspaper. She, this one that I'm describing in this poem called Jewish Portrait, she's not like you. She's a diaspora kind of Jew whose eyes dart around in fear. She's dressed in this kind of old fashioned way and she's carrying bundles. She's not gonna put them down because she needs to move, right? Kol makom ach makom shel arayut. Any place she might stumble on is a place that won't last. So she's defined, this figure here, who's being called a Jew, a diaspora kind of Jew, is sort of defined by um, her impermanence, her need to move. She's a, a refugee, right? And, and, and in that second stanza, you can move it up a little bit, but I, it seems to me that a lot of people are looking also on, 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 on uh, hard copy. In that second stanza on the road, caravans pass her by, Ukrainian peasants in their carts, dark-skinned refugees screaming, babes in arms dry up in the sun, flies clinging to their eyes, people carry mattresses on their heads, a clang of pots and pans. She's slow, slowing down the caravan. Now, where are we? Where is this caravan? Now, remember I told you that this is, you know, that there's this kind of blurring here that happens in the poem. And so you might think that we begin in, in Lebanon during the war, but, the, but this second passage here, this second stanza that begins on the road, caravans pass her by and that kind of extended description is a more kind of universal description of refugees everywhere. Where are these people moving from? Where are they going? It's like the, a mass of humanity. And in that mass of humanity, this diaspora Jew, who is not like you, the reader of this poem, she stops and she waits. Because she doesn't have family with her, she can wait a little bit. And then she spies a coin. She sees a kind of a coin. And this, I have to confess to you that this is the part of the poem that confuses me the most. The other parts I kind of get, but this, if anybody has ideas about what this is doing here after we're done reading, I'd be interested. Um, but there's something about this coin and its sparkling quality that, um, that amuses her, that gives her pleasure, maybe because it's so distinct and different from her, or other experience on this particular day, right? But uh, 
notice here, don't, don't, don't go up too far, Tim. Ta'ut lachshov she yatsa midata. Don't think she's lost her mind. So that's a note to us, to the reader, to, to be respectful. And I think that, you know, this is, again, for me as a reader, this is a very typically Rabikopichian gesture, right? Respect the women in the poem. And so, so to that kind of, again, the, the, the self and other, the Arab and the Jew that we saw in Abichai's work, Rabikovich gives it a specific dimension. There's a kind of a Palestinian dimension here. She blurs it. She creates a kind of a Venn diagram. We're all interconnected. And then finally, she adds the element of gender. The, the, the figures in, in Rabi Kovic's work who are the most oppressed, and if you, if you got the packet in time and, and read that last poem, you know what I'm talking about, which, which describes a kind of a sexual assault, right? The women, and especially young women, young women and older women, right, are often the most marginalized members of society in, 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 the, in, the, in, in Rabi Kovic's poetic world. And so here when she says, just because she's off to the side there and you, you know, she's kind of dusty and she's carrying all her bags and she looks like she doesn't have a place to stay. She's not crazy. She's not crazy. And, and in this, this sort of interior world, right? This, this reminds me of that line in, in Amichai's work where they're sort of, the emotion is inside, right? A kernel of sun crimson dawns in her heart. She's smiling to herself. She's no longer upset. The next verse. She has no use for this business, Jerusalem. Day after day, they wrangle over the Temple Mount. So now we're back in a specific topography, right? Now we're back in a specific place. If you were wondering what the Ukrainian peasants we're doing here. Well, now we're back in Jerusalem. It's a poem. It doesn't have to make absolute temporal and spatial sense. And again, there's this, 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 this sort of intentional sort of blurring and confusing uh, 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 apparatus that's set up for the reader to make us understand this condition of, of being a refugee of being uh, expelled, evicted, which is somehow related to Jewishness, right? Remember the title of the poem, Dukan Yud. She has no use for this business, Jerusalem. Day after day, they wrangle over the Temple Mount. Each man smites and reviles his brother and the dead prophet shrieks, who hath required this at your hand to trample my course? So Rabikovich, like Amichai, but I think, um, yeah, I would say the both of them together, they, they draw on the full spectrum of language available to them, from the biblical to the most contemporary slang. And in this stanza, and the chefetz ben Yanazeh, she doesn't, what is like, what's the business with Jerusalem? Why are they arguing over Jerusalem? Who gets it? Who belongs? Who, who, who does it belong to? And all of the, the wrangling, the fighting over that one, the Temple Mount is, you know, essentially we're back in that, that, that world again from, from the Amichai poem of Hartzion and, and the Akedah, the heart of the matter. She's not interested in politics in that way. And again, to just, you know, when you look, if you look at the bottom of the page, you'll get like a little bit of, of uh, insight into um, the depth here of the biblical citation. So the biblical citation here comes from Isaiah. Anavi amet tzover. That prophet is shrieking and he says, mi bikesh zod miadchem romos chatzerav. It's a very kind of obscure, you know, uh, kind of reference. But in, in that moment, there's uh, the, the situation there in Isaiah is there's kind of a description of excessive sacrifice, like people paying too much attention, bringing too much stuff to honor God. And God comes and says, I don't need all of that. It's too much. You're paying too much attention. You're giving too much, right? And, and again, I think because it's the prophetic text, you know, there is this suggestion of kind of false piety or kind of a performative piety, but not a real connection to the place. Okay, now we get the rest of the story about this woman. And for me as a reader, the big twist at the end of this poem is to find out that she has a home. 
because she she arrives home right in other words she, there is this kind of relationship to that scene of of refugees and kind of uh their references to maybe her own kind of impermanent or temporary quality right with the with the packs there but it turns out she has a place to go she'll find her house her feet stub against the sharp gravel stones dust soils her dress she will bolt the inner door so this is just a gorgeous gorgeous image here not locking i have to ask the difference between locking and bolting i think there's a little bit of song of songs here as well with all of the sort of the women moving in and out of the doorways and the doorways being locked. That's another, that's another class. But she, she finds a way home and she bathes her feet, which I think has to be a little bit of Mary Magdalene. I think that there's a little bit, who was it that bathed Jesus's feet, right? As a kind of a, a, a way to wash away sin. In the dark, she knows the features of her face as a blind man knows the feel of his temples. Her eyes, kuzarim kulot, the Khazars, Ukrainians, Khazars, who are these people? She has a broad face. Guf kaved shel isha mibne hamakom. Her body, the heavy body of a native woman, bne hamakom, the sons of the place, the people of the place. Doshlishi Eretz Israel, third generation in the land of Israel. And Again, the language here, I need to point out, and the translators give us some excellent notes here, right? So in addition to the biblical quotation from Isaiah, here we have the term b'nei ha'makom. It's a kind of a, a, a term, right, that's used, it's almost a military term to use to describe um, how the Palestinian population. So she's using like these different registers of language, almost in a kind of a collage. Now, what does it mean in this poem? And I'm gonna stop here because I want, I want to leave time for questions and discussion, right? But I'll leave you with this. What does it mean to call this figure Jewish? In what way is she Jewish? She is native and we don't have time for this, but you'll keep in mind that the term makom, which appears in all of these works again and again and again, in Hebrew is a synonym for God. Right, sort of marks that that place where um, where the children of Israel encountered the divine presence. So, what does it mean for a local to be Jewish? Doshli Shibaz Israel, and that term there at the end, the land of Israel, um, from the you know sort of the, the the heart of the Zionist lexicon, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. This is the term that's used in the Bible. And it's the term that is that is really um, becomes historiographically the term of choice in the pre-state period, but certainly even to this day, right? In other words, it, it conveys a sense of attachment and uh, and belonging. What does it mean to call this person Jewish? And what is it? What is the poem trying to kind of articulate about the evolution of these relationships between self and other? Okay, I'm going to stop there and. We can maybe get to the second poem, but I am going to stop there just to sort of see if there are comments and questions. This is a lot. Oh, I see somebody who I haven't seen in a long time on the screen. Um, a lot of a lot of responses to the coin, like really a lot. Um, many well, people many people are um, reading it as a symbol of hope. Mm. Um, and I I couldn't I actually. Um, I couldn't help noticing that that in the same um, sentence is the word svach, which is where the where the ram is caught in the thicket in the Akedah. Yes. I don't so this is the this is the third line. It's actually in the Hebrew there. It's line thirty one. The third line in that 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 uh, stanza that begins suddenly she sees a coin. I thought a lot about this and I didn't want to go into it. But Julia, do you have an idea about it? Like so, the svach just to get everybody up to speed. Svach means thicket. And that's what, to go back to the earlier poem with the Akedah, that's what the isle, the ram is kind of caught in. And that's how they save the day and make the sacrifice and Isaac survives and was traumatized of course because his father almost killed him. But the Svach there, it's just a very, um, it's a weird image, 
because the svach is sort of like, it's fertile and it's giving off plagim, rivulets of moisture. It's a very bizarre image. Um, yeah, the only thing I could think of was maybe, you know, along the lines of people suggesting that the coin is about hope, right? That's, that's what the, the ram sort of represents the idea that there's a way out also, maybe. That's nice. Um, I, I mean, the, uh, it, it, look, I don't, I don't think of this. I want to say the other poem, the, the second Rabbi Kovach poem, if we have time, we'll get to it. That's a poem that leaves me in despair. This is not a despairing poem, I don't think. I don't read this poem in a ble as a bleak statement. I read it as realistic, as, as pragmatic. Um, people are also uh, suggesting um, revelation, that Moses and the burning bush. Oh, nice. Very nice. But that's a different word. But that's OK. It's the sne. Right. right, but I have, oh, that wasn't a comment on the word spach, but more about the coin and sort of. But, but the I think that it, it can work because of the neats nuts. In other words, look, a poem, just to sort of, as a matter of general practice, I always tell my students this, a poem can mean more than one thing. It doesn't mean that it can mean anything. <laughs> so I would sort of say, you know, where do we get the spach on its own? I don't think is enough for the, for the burning bush. But the svach, the thicket with the nitznuts, with the spark, that maybe is. And then there is that idea that adds to this idea of, of, of hope or a bright spot. So I think, um, I, I was also surprised that, that I, I mentioned it because several people mentioned the burning bush and one person wrote, um, you, you know, kind of connecting it to the, to the line where, um, but she might seem crazy, but actually she's not. It's sort of like a mystical revelation can be mistaken as someone kind of losing it. Absolutely. That's great. I mean, the prophets were nuts, right? We, they had to have been. They, they, were, they were visited by these, you know, hallucinations and, you know, anything. Um, so um, a lot of comments about about Jerusalem also, and maybe the, the coin, um, mm. th there's so much here. Um, sort of the, the coin evoking the thought of like a more idyllic Jerusalem perhaps, or um, kind of the ancientness of, of coins and the sense of, of long, a long presence in Jerusalem. Um, those, are, those are some of the comments about Jerusalem. Um, and where is the home kind of travels around? Um, is Jerusalem home? Is it not? Well, for, I think for the person, for the speaker in this, for the woman being described in this poem, what, you know, that Jerusalem is of no interest to her. Meaning that that whole argument about who the land, that whole political argument about who owns what is not relevant for her because she's native. She doesn't need to argue about it. She just is B'nai HaMakom. She's of the place. And so, you know, in, in, implicit, I think there, it, it, and not in a, in a way that is meant to be politically provocative. It's, it's more just uh, on my part, right? The poem is definitely politically provocative, but um, I think, you know, there's it's just kind of a statement of fact that if you're, if you're born in a place, you, you feel a sense of belonging and you don't need to prove it in, in the way. You don't need to fight about it. It's just, you just go home and lock the door and there you are. Or in this case, you bolt the door. Uh, so a lot of comments are, are asking uh, questions or, or getting at what, what I think is at the, the heart of, of the poem, you know, the, as, as, um, as noted in the title, A Jewish Portrait, just kind of trying to understand more who this woman is, right? She has, she has this, um, diasporous, dias, diasporic element to her. Um, there, there are the, you know, the Ukrainians and the caravans and the yeah. refugees um, at the end, you know, but then it turns out she's third generation um, you, Eretz Yisraeli, but also she has the blue eyes. Does that mean she's the product of, you know, perhaps a rape or sort of a, a mixed ancestry. There's, there's so much, she is so many things in this poem. Nice. She belongs to so many groups. 
I think so. I mean, I don't think that there's really an, I think it's a great observation. I don't, I don't think that, you know, when we think about, um, I don't know if Robbie Kovic would have agreed with this, but when we think about identity and we, we try to, to not essentialize, right? So one of, the poem, one of the things that the poem gives us is this identity that seems mixed or what we would call today hyphenated, um, you know, because in the beginning of the poem, again, when she says, when, when the, when the narr you know, the speaker says, she is not your sort, she's a diaspora kind of Jew, she means she's not Israeli like you. And that also could imply she's not native like you, right? In other words, she wasn't born in this place. She's not B'nai HaMakom. She's diasporic. She's actually exilic is a better, right? The term in Hebrew is galutit. And so, which has a really negative connotation in, in Hebrew, right? We don't really have, in English, I don't think we have, we don't have words, we might, we might but at least not in, in this context. And they even give us that, yeah, the translator gives us that, that negative thing. And so the, the mixedness, I think part of it has to do again with this kind of universal scene of not being at home, but then there's also a sense in, 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 again, I don't know if this is what Rabbi Kovic had in her mind, but that's okay. We don't need to talk about the intentionality of the poet. Um, but there, there is a sense that, is, that being Israeli is different than being Jewish, is what I wanna say. And that there is this kind of emerging, evolving identity that happens in that place, which is of that place that necessitates a kind of a reevaluation of what self and other means. That's where I would go, that's where I would go with that. It's almost, I'm just um, drawing on a few comments here. There, there's a way in which she's she's sort of the most Jewish. It's like that, you know, here are the men arguing about Jerusalem and its significance, but she's she's like a, the permanent wanderer who's never at home. She doesn't unpack her bundles. How, how you know, how doesn't get more Jewish than that? She is the most Jewish. I think that that's exactly right. And remember again the politics of this particular moment. This is before before the first Intifada, right? This is this is a long time ago politically that she's making these observations about exile and who are who are the most exiled in this moment in 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 this you know particular moment in that part of the world the most exiled are are the palestinians and they are therefore the most jewish in in the world of the poem um, i have more comments and questions but it, I don't know if you want to, do you want to touch on the I last wanna, poem? I want to say just one, I'll just say a few things about, because this last poem is, is a lot, and I wasn't even sure if, if it was going to, if I was going to include it, but I really put it, I put it in so that you could, so that you could just have it. Um, and I'll just, I'll just kind of introduce it. Um, again, probably, you know, a handful of one, one of the most important Hebrew poems, really, of the last half century. And, you know, for some of the reasons that I touched on, in terms of Robbie Kovic's kind of mastery of different linguistic registers, um, like Diukan UD, in other words, it's it's written, um, you know, it's written in this uh, in this very political climate uh, during the first war in Lebanon in the early 80s, 1982, um, and the refrain that repeats, Ani Lokan, I am not here. Um, and it repeats over and over, you know, several times throughout the poem. And in between the repetition of that refrain, we, we read of a kind of a scene of violence that is unfolding. It's predicted from the very beginning of the poem that this young girl, um, she's not gonna make it till the end of the day. Um, and then a man walks up the mountain, which of course brings us back to that scene of, of Abraham walking up the mountain, right? And we know that it's not gonna be good right, that there's some kind of violence that's going um, to happen. And all throughout um, this prediction of violence, the voice in the poem says, I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm not here. Now, logically, that's not possible. Like, in other words, so to say, to point to this place and say, here, but I'm not here, it's a kind of a logical impossibility as, as a statement. And, you know, this notion of, of hovering, I think, I was thinking a lot about this um, in preparing for this session, you know, hovering as a response 
to overwhelming violence, right? Essentially, I'll, I'll point us to, to just one passage. This is on um, the very, uh, where is this? On page eight, where she says, um, I found a very simple method. Right, this is the speaker in the poem. She says, I found a simple method, not so much as a foot breath on land, not flying either, hovering at low altitude. So in the face of violence, what is the ethical position? What do you do when you're a witness to violence or violence that you know is going to happen, particularly violence against a defenseless young girl? Now you can either ignore it entirely. That's the flying way high up. Or you can be in it, right? You could be down there helping. And the speaker in the poem says, well, I'm not gonna do either of those. I'm gonna do this rechifan, this hovering. I'm just gonna kind of watch it. And I was just, you know, it's, it seems to me that this is a, you know, she's, it's a very problematic position, right? How do you, how do you witness violence? What do you do about it? And in this moment, this is, you know, in the, in the moment that this poem is written, obviously the location is Lebanon and, and the victims are the people who are suffering there. But there is, I think, a, a more universal, a kind of a broader way of thinking about this question of what, what do we as readers do when we encounter violence? Do we turn away? Do we fly? Do we get in it? Do we help? Or do we doom scroll? You know, do we just kind of watch it on our phones and, right, that would be, doom scrolling, right? This kind of looking through and being numbed by everything around us. It's a very contemporary poem in, 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 in my understanding, right? Uh, what's the psychological defense mechanism that you use when you are overwhelmed by, uh, by what the world is, is doing? And, and so the, the critique here, I think, is, is of this position of just, you know, just watching it, watching it, hovering above it and not doing anything in it, picking up your skirts, right? There's that marvelous image of the picking up your skirts, don't get them dirty, um, but, but don't really get involved. And so, you know, there, again, the, the self-other relationship is always something that is, has a kind of a historically specific evolution, but this, again, this stance of what it means to ethically witness, what it means to really confront injustice is something that I think that this poem uh, you know, brings to us even to this day. I'm gonna stop and just see if there are any, you know, that's a lot. And this is a, this is a lot of a poem, um, but I wanted to, to, you know, to just, you know, give this, give this to you as a parting, uh, you know, poem to maybe that you could come back to. Julie, I don't know if there are comments or questions that people you wanna squeeze um, in here in the last few minutes. Yeah, so um, I wanna ask you a, a sort of a closing question, but I, I did just want to share. Um, I, I noticed that, and a, a few other people noticed um, that that hovering, you know, that's the word for God's presence hovering, um, hovering over things before creation. So God just witnessed bad things happening. Is that what you just said, Julia? Um, I suppose so. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it's a great, I mean, Rabikovich is a marvelous poet. Look, the, the more immediate association for a, an Israeli reader is, is um, and I think that the, um, this is in the notes, like l'achef, it means like to be what we call, uh, we used to call in English a space cadet. Somebody's just kind of out of it, you know? Lady. And then there's also this notion of the helicopter, the military, military helicopters that kind of go close to the ground. So she's really, She's really piling it on with that term, absolutely. So, so we're at three thirty. I so I don't know if like within one minute you can answer this, but um, we looked at so many. You know, the theme of the series is the other, and and we looked at so many others today. Um, um, really, so many different different kinds of relationships. I don't know if there's anything um, global that you can say about how Israeli poetry addresses this theme. I mean. I would, I would just return to this notion of it being uh, kind of embedded in historical evolution and that historical evolution has to do with power. 
you know? And, and so in that moment in Pegasus poem, that's why I like the, the arc of Pegasus poem because it's sensitive to power relationships and how they, and how they change. And you can see even in the movement between Amichai's work and Rabi Kovic's work, a sensitivity, um, who has political power, who has power over a particular space. These are things that are always gonna shape the way that Israeli authors treat this question of self and other. Uh, thank you so much for teaching us today. I think this is such a um, kind of like a more meditative way of entering into this this theme and it's the, the poems are from a certain time and yet timeless. So really thank you for sharing this with us. My pleasure. Um, Thanks everybody for sharing your day. There were, there were so many wonderful comments that I wish I could have shared, but I will share all of them with Professor Mann. Thank um, you. Thank, thanks to everyone for joining us. And um, and I plugged Hi, the wrong- Hi, Hurwitz. I see you there. I plugged ah. the, wrong, the wrong session last week, but next week we will have um, we will have Professor Braffman. So we'll be going from poetry to philosophy. So uh, Hi, guys, we'll see great. you all then. And uh, have a good week in the meantime. Bye-bye. Thank you.